Good morning, Church. I'm Lori. Before we get to our praise and worship, let us all read this verse from John 8:12 in the New Living Translation. It says, "Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, 'I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life.'" Today, as we go through the many challenges in these dark times, um, let us not despair and always remember that uh, He is the light that will push the darkness away. He is the strength that will fight our battles and He will forever shine in the lives of those who believe and truly love Him. So today as we worship Him, let us soak in our, in our worship and our praises as the sun shines upon the earth and just sing of His goodness and know that He is our one true living hope. So let's worship!
Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? It's me, Pastoret, here in the metro space in Trinoma. You may be wondering, Pastor, is there service today? Absolutely, there is service today, but the service is still online. Oh, I know. Although we are here filming uh, our broadcast for the service, unfortunately, under the GCQ, we are still not able to come together as a church physically, but at least we know now, at least you know now that the Metro Space is already open and we are functioning and things are moving forward, things are progressing. So I know little by little we're going to be coming back sooner than you think and we'll be able to meet together as a church, worship together as a church. Speaking of worship, wasn't that a wonderful time of worship today? There's a lot of praise going on in, in our service as we begin. Because the Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made and that we should rejoice and we should be glad in it. So different feeling for me once again. Because I've been, you know, as you've seen before in the past, I've been filming from home. But now I'm back here again on this platform, on this stage in which the Lord has called me for, for, to, to minister and to preach to you guys. If you're here, this is your first time. Welcome. My name is Pastor Etienne Morales, and I am the lead pastor of New Life Christian Center, North Metro, or just New Life North Metro. And we just want to welcome you to our Home is Live broadcast on Sunday service where we share the Word of God to you and to everybody else who's listening, to all our family our North Metro family out there. Guys, malapit na. It's getting closer and closer. As you can see, we're, we're here already. So sooner or later, you will be here as well. So we're excited for that. And we're, we're looking forward to the time when we can come together as a family and just worship and, and, and hear the word and fellowship. You know, that's one thing that I think we miss the most. Because we have the word and we have the worship going online, but it's the fellowship. It's the being able to see one another, touch one another, pray with one another physically, just kamustahan, just checking up on one another. I believe that is part of the call of the church, not just to preach the Word of God, but to be there physically for one another. And that's, I think, a direction that I, I want to go today in my message. So if you would, Let's begin this word and let me begin with prayer and then let's go for it. All right, guys? Great. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to this step, this step that we can come back to the metro space, come back to the place where we would gather. And you would always send the priest first. In the old covenant, Lord God, whenever there was a move of God, you would let the leaders and the priests go first. They were the first to step into the waters. They were the first to enter into the promised land. So Lord God, thank you for allowing us to go first here to prepare the way to make sure that those to follow will know that they have a place that is secure, a place that is safe, a place that they can come together to worship, to hear the word, and to fellowship. Lord, I lift up this time right now uh, as I preach the word. Lord God, I thank you for your anointing upon me to do what you've called me to do. Thank you for the gift that is upon me to be able to, to preach and to teach the Word of God. But more than the gift, I pray for your anointing, the supernatural upon my natural, Lord God, to be able to speak the words from heaven. Holy Spirit, this is yours. This is your service. Have your way. Uh, use me in whatever capacity you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Also, Holy Spirit, I also pray for everybody's listening. I come against any distraction that would try to hinder people from coming in and hearing the Word of God and from receiving. Even when they're listening now, there will be no distractions in Jesus' name. We can come together and we can focus on the Word. Amen? Awesome. Well, today I want to share something with you that's very new and fresh to me. Uh, last Saturday, the day is Sunday, a week ago Saturday, a very good friend of mine 
went on to be with the Lord. He was only 43 years old. And this week I had to do something that was very difficult. You know, I, one of the two most difficult things I did was do a serve, wake service for my dad. And then for my mom and my mother-in-law, three actually. This is, this is close there. A very good friend of mine went on to be in, with the Lord after battling with pancreatic cancer, which eventually spread to his liver. And we, during that time, you know, actually it happened Saturday, but on Thursday night going into Friday, I actually dreamt that I was in his wake service. And I was with his widow, his wife, in the dream. And we were seated together and we were talking in the, in the dream. And I was crying and I was crying in that dream. And I was telling her, you know, we're here for you. And all of a sudden, he taps me on the shoulder in the dream. And there he is. How many of you know when somebody's been battling with, with a sickness or a disease, especially like cancer, it takes a toll on them physically and it really did on him. But when I saw him in the dream, he looked like he was cancer-free. He looked like there was nothing wrong. He, he was, his face was bright and white and I could just imagine him whole, completely whole. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And he says, ah, we got you, we got you. I said, this is not a funny joke. You don't, you don't joke about things like this. Well, anyway, that was the dream. So Friday, I woke up, I called up his wife. And I asked how they were. And she said that he has been deteriorating lately. And she would love for us to come and to visit. And under that time, I, I, we were still not under GCQ. We were still, I could not still leave the house. And I told her, as soon as Monday hits, for sure, for sure, I will go there and I will visit you. But Monday, on Monday, when I finally got to see him, uh, he was no longer with us. He was with the Lord because Monday is when I did his cremation service. So I kept my promise to him. But Monday, I would see him. And yeah, but he was no longer with us. And it really, it really, it really bothered me, I guess, personally. And sometimes we know, how many of you know that Regret is not a thing we should, we should live with. Yeah? Regret is not a thing that you want to live with in your life. It's, and I pray that if you are feeling regret over a loved one or over people, make, do what you can to make things right. If that person has already gone ahead, the Bible says to cast your cares upon the Lord. I believe regret is one of the things that we can cast our cares, what we can cast to the Lord. And so... That's what I did. I said, Lord, I'm not going to dwell on should have, would have, could have. But I will make the most of the moment. I will make the most of the time. I will make the most of today. And during that cremation service, I shared a message to the family. And, and it, it was three things that I've learned from, from this person. Maybe life lessons. The first one was, to live passionately because the guy was a very passionate, he was a very passionate person. He really, everything he did, he, he really went all out. Secondly, I said, sometimes it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong, but we need to pursue peace. We need, because there was a time in our relationship that we separated as friends. We walked away because of a misunderstanding. And it took many, many, many years before we came back and we reconciled. And we became close again. We became friends. And when we did, by the, I believe it was by the grace of God. It was just like we just never parted, even if it was years. It just, we started all over again. And really, I believe it is God's mercy and grace that allowed us to do that. And the third thing I, I said was that life is short. We really don't know how long we have. So let's not procrastinate. Let's not waste our time. You know, I could sit here and preach this message to you. But one thing that I did admire in the eulogy is that everybody talked about him as the, the glue guy. He was the kind of person that wanted to make sure everybody was okay with one another. He wanted to make sure that everybody, there was no samaan ng loob. He wanted to make sure that if two people were fighting, that he would come in. He was always the, the middleman. That was just who he was. 
That was just his character. He was always trying to get the groups to come together to make peace because he really hated strife. He really hated that thing. And even though we had that, I praise God that there was a time that we still got to reconcile. So what happened was after all of this on Wednesday when we finished with the, with the last service, a couple of friends of mine from, from the States began to message me saying that they heard the message. And same thing happened between myself and this couple that are, are in the States, that we did part ways for a while. And there were years again that had been lost. And I just realized that, that we were coming together. We were, we, there was, we were saying sorry to one another. And we were beginning to reconcile once again with one another. And they said, and I, and I agreed that we, they, we wanted to start off again like we never, it never was we never separated in the first place. And I said, wow, even in his death, even in my friend's death, he was still reconciling people together. He was still bringing people together. He was still calling. He was still doing his part to make sure that there were pe people were not apart from each other, that people were coming together as friends and reuniting and resolving issues. You know, I guess we could say that he had a ministry of reconciliation. And that's something that I want to share today with us, with all of us. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we all are to be ministers of reconciliation. It's not just him, not just my friend who has this unique calling and gifting to reconcile people. I believe that each and every one of us by the grace of God. Because we cannot do anything without God's grace and not God's anointing. That we also have this ministry to reconcile. To, to be reconcilers. To bring people together. But I want to read the context. The verse in context. Aside from bringing people together. I think the greatest relationship that we can do is to bring people to the Lord. Amen. So if you have your Bible with me, please open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So it says this, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though, have, even though we have known Christ, or Jesus according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, or in Jesus, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and now has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You know, every time we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we usually start with 17 and then we jump to 21. We say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Wow, how did that happen? For he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. These two verses are what we could say a staple or foundation or rock, solid rock of our faith. That we, were no, we are no longer sinners, but we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How did this happen? Jesus 
took our unrighteousness, our sin, put it upon Himself on the cross, and He gave us His righteousness or His righteous nature. That is what happens to every believer. Now, now we can say we are no longer sinners. We are now the righteousness of God. As He is, so are we in this world. Amen? This is a truth that would help us live life properly that we would not live in condemnation, shame, and guilt. Yes, there are times that we would still fall, we would still sin, but this truth is telling you and I that we are no longer who we used to be. Something happened because of what Jesus did that now we are different, we are brand new. But it doesn't begin with just the change. It begins with a mindset. Everybody say mindset. Because it's so important to understand that when we have the right mindset, we are able to do the thing which God wants us to do. It says, it starts with the mindset in verse 16, talks about what Jesus did, and then gives us a pattern or gives us an instruction on what to do. And now, in the end, verse 21 gives us the reason why we can do it. So you can see, it's not just this is what Jesus did and this is how He did it. No, there's a mindset that we need to understand. First, followed by what Jesus did, followed now by an instruction that what we must now do or we must now walk in or live in, and then eventually giving us the reason why we can do the supernatural, why we can do this thing which God has called us to do. Amen? So this verse is more, not more than just doctrine. It's also a reproof, instruction, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Amen? The Word of God is full. So the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it begins with this. Do not consider anybody according to the flesh. Now, what does that mean to not consider people according to the flesh? To consider somebody according to the flesh basically means that you have a preconceived notion of somebody or you are basing somebody's value, worth, persona based on what they do and not really who they are. You see, many times when we look at people, when we look at relationships, even to start a relationship. I remember one of my closest friends in the world. He lives in Australia now. And every time we go for Hillsong Conference, we would, we would be with him and his family. But we didn't start our relationship off right. I remember the first time I actually met him was I was in grade 7. And we were lining up to graduation. And I really didn't know him because, you know, in the school that I went to, there was a foreigner's class, so I stuck, they stuck, I don't know why they put me in the foreigner's class. Pilipilong Pilipino, kumuha ba akong foreigner? Anyway, they put me in the foreigner's class, and so I grew up with the same people the whole time. But then, what happened is this guy kept bugging me. The whole time in the line, he kept bugging me, he kept calling me names, and I got really irritated with him. And I was like, wow, I really want to hit him, but he was like a foot or two taller than me at that time. And I was thinking, I, I'll, I'll die if I do anything against him. So I really disliked him. And when we got to high school, it so happened that I went to a classroom with where his barcada was all there. And then I got to know him. You see, sometimes first impressions are the wrong impression. Let's not base everybody on our first impression. Some pe sometimes we can start or get off on the wrong foot. That we must give people a chance. Can everybody say that? Sometimes we need to give people a chance. And it so happened that eventually in second year high school, we became classmates, I think two years straight. And because of that, we really developed a relationship that lasted even until now. Many, many years after graduation, we are still friends. We're still close to one another. Although if you ask him, he'll deny it, but that's just who he is. That's the kind of person he is. But you know, we, we love each other and we love, our families love each other as well. And he really loves Judah, so that's a really big plus to, to it. So what happens is this. What I'm trying to say, my point is, many times we disqualify people on how they look on the outside 
or maybe on their first impression. The Bible is saying this, we cannot judge people on their outward appearance because God doesn't judge people on their outward appearance. We cannot also judge people based on their actions. So many times, we judge people on how they act, not really knowing why they do such things. It's very important to know why, to find out why a certain person acts a certain way. And so I encourage you, when you if, if you have, there's this person here that maybe you're not really getting along with, or you maybe you don't want to get along with, or maybe you're not giving them a chance. Maybe try to figure out, get to know them a little more. Try to find out the why be, be behind the person's actions or what they're doing. Maybe they're hurting. Maybe they're lost. Maybe they're confused. Maybe they're crying out. Maybe they're crying out to you. They're trying to get your attention. And maybe it's in a negative way. But they're crying out and they need help. You know, it says in, in Ephesians chapter 1, in the message translation, you see, the world is not peripheral to the church. I'm oh, sorry, the church is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. What does that mean? It means people are looking at you and I. Why? Because there's something that happened between you and I. We are new creations. And they're looking for answers. And sometimes they get our attention in, the, in a wrong way. They're, maybe they're just trying to get your attention. I pray that we no longer look at people according to the flesh, according to their mistakes, according to their past. Because sometimes relationships will never be restored if we always think about, well, you did this before and you did this back then. And, I, and until you get right back then, then maybe. But no, sometimes we really need a fresh new start. Thank God that Jesus gave us a fresh new start. When, he, when we received Him as Lord and Savior, the Bible says your sins and your lawless deeds, He remembers no more. Though they may be as red as scarlet, He washes them as white as snow. If God can give you and I a second, third, fourth, tenth, one hundredth chance, do you, don't you think people deserve another chance? You know, I pray that we would realize this, that life's too short to hold on to grudges, that we would give people an opportunity, that we can give, other people can give us an opportunity to be able to reconcile and, and go back to maybe where we, was, where we were before and maybe bring it even to a better place. So it goes on to say that the attitude we must have is that everybody, God loves everyone and everybody deserves another chance. And then he goes on to say what Jesus did for you and I. Why we no longer consider each other according to the flesh? Because we are a new creation. And a new creation is not on the outside. It's in your spirit. And let me tell you, this change that will happen is not an external change. It's a change from the inside. Sometimes the shell is harder to crack. It's harder to open. But eventually, I believe that shell will crack. And the outer man, uh, will, which is decaying, will be eventually break. And then the inner man, the new man, the man in Christ's image and likeness, will come forth. And people will begin to see the fruit of us abiding in Christ. And He is our vine, and we are our branches, and we only bear fruit because of Him. Amen? After this great change happens, the Bible says this, Now all things are of God. Who has reconciled. This word reconciled was repeated five times in two or three scriptures, two or three verses, five times. How many of you know the word to reconcile is important to God? If Jesus repeats it or Paul repeats it five times, then it's important. So, what does this word reconcile mean? The word reconciled as an action means an exchange. Can you hear me? The word reconciled as a verb, when it's a verb, using to re reconciled, reconciling, be reconciled, these are all action words. The word used there means to exchange, meaning like, like when you exchange money at a, at a 
uh, how do you say that? Where you, where you exchange money, money changer. Duh. You exchange money in the money changer. You give them, uh, let's say, pesos and they give you dollars. You give them a ringgit and they give you Aussie dollars. You know, it, there's an exchange that happens. So when God, Jesus, when Paul says to be reconciled means we need to accept this exchange. Where does this exchange happen? When it talks about God and us, means God gives us something and we exchange something with Him. Amen? This is what we call a divine exchange. And how many of you know, usually when you change in dollars and pesos or money changer, you want a good rate. You want a good rate. You want it na patas, it's the same. But let me tell you, when God and us exchange, He, <laughs> he always gives us a much higher value than what we give Him. Amen? God will always give us something more than what we would receive, uh, what we would give to Him. Amen? We receive more than what we would be giving to Him. Now, when the word reconciled or reconciliation is used as a noun, it just means this, a restoration of favor. Did you hear that? The word reconciliation means a restoration of favor or a restoration of right standing before the person. When I, let's say, Mara and I would fight and I want to reconcile. When we fight, I'm not really the best person for my wife. Sometimes she would not mind me when we fight. And justifiable because sometimes I can be very, you know, I can't use that word here. But when, I'm, when we reconcile, it restores our relationship. It's, it, 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 I get favor once again with my wife. You understand? I can cuddle with her again. I can hug her again. I can kiss her again. Prior to that, I can't even go near her. She'll hmm, get away. You know? When there is no reconciliation, we cannot come together. But when we are reconciled, when there is reconciliation, there is a restoration of favor. So now I want to read this verse, exchanging the word reconciled with the word exchange or divine exchange and the word reconciliation with the, word, with the restoration of favor. So it goes like this. Now all things are of God who has given us a divine exchange between us and himself through Christ Jesus, and now has given us a ministry to do what? To restore favor between who? Humanity and God. See, once God has we have restored favor, God has restored favor with us. How? Through this divine exchange between Jesus and us, we are now restored into favor, and now God is telling us uh, His plan it's not only that we are restored, not to be selfish, but we need to go and help others restore favor with God. That is that God was in Christ exchanging, divine exchanging the world to Himself or bringing the world in favor to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Now has committed to us a word, a word of what? A restoration of of favor. Amen? When we, you know what the gospel is? The gospel is this. It's good news. And the good news is this. Jesus did everything for us and now He wants to have this divine exchange. All His goodness for all our filth. Did you see that? All His goodness for all, everything that's wrong with us. He will take everything that's wrong with us and He will give us all His goodness. And because He does this, we have restored favor with God. We have grace with the Father. Amen? You see, that's what the world needs to hear. That Jesus Himself took our filthiness and gave us all His goodness. And now they need to receive this restoration of favor. Then it goes on to this. Now then we are ambassadors. What is the word ambassador? The word ambassador is the word presbeo, where it's the word bishop. 
The word bishop means to oversee. Look at this. Now that we have received this divine exchange, God is telling us we are now to oversee our brethren. We are to oversee them through Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It's a responsibility. Once we have received favor with God, once we have received this divine exchange, we are not just to enjoy the benefits for ourselves. Now, the Lord is saying, once you have received this benefit, it's time that you go. And God has given us oversight. Over who? I believe we all have a sphere, <coughs> excuse me, we all have a sphere of influence. We all have people in our life that God has put us in contact with. Whether we like them or not, whether we are in good terms or we're not in good terms with them, God has given us this sphere of people that we know or we have contact with. And God has now given us oversight. Once you are a new creation, you are now, given, you are now in a position of authority. And now the Lord has given you oversight. Like a bishop overseeing a church, God has given us oversight over the people. Wow, what a great, you know what? It's not pressure to have this responsibility. I believe if you think of it as pressure, then you're never going to do it. You're going to feel such a burden for it. But think of it as an opportunity. Think of it as a privilege. Think of it that God would trust you. Yes, you. He trusted me. I don't know why, but he did. And now he's trusting you. Yes, you. He's trusting you to oversee over the lives of the people that he has entrusted in you. How will I do this? Well, that's why he ends in verse 21 by saying, He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. It's all because of God's grace. And God's grace enabled favor to come into our life. And now that you have favor in your life, you also have the divine anointing or divine ability to go and be the ambassador, be the presbytery, be the bishop, be the overseer of those who need to hear this word. You know, many people will just stop right there. But the verse continues in the next chapter. What does it say here? We then, as it is 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 3, it's continuing the same thought. We then, as workers together with Jesus, also plead with you not to receive this grace of God in vain. See, the grace of God has a purpose. And if we are not going to fulfill the purpose in which the grace was poured out into our life, we may take this grace of God in vain. It says, don't do that. So we have a choice. We have a choice whether to go and do what God told us to do, or we just are afraid and do nothing. I encourage you, don't let fear or disappointment or condemnation hinder you from doing what God has equipped you to do in Christ Jesus. Amen? We then, as workers together with Him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have held you. Behold, and this is what I want to end up or wrap up my preaching today. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Wow. <laughs> Talk about urgency. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. Many of us, we like to put things off. I'll see you on Monday. Ah. Oh. What if Monday comes and it's too late? We don't know what's going to happen. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of reconciliation. Today is the day of this divine exchange that restores God's favor to mankind. Look around you. Do not consider people according to the flesh. Look around you. See those who need to hear this good news who need to receive 
this divine exchange? Who, what relationships are you that, that God has placed in your life, whether they're ongoing or whether they're on pause? What relationships has God placed? Let me tell you, <coughs> excuse me, God is calling us. He has given us oversight. He has given us a divine anointing and divine ability to go out and to do and to reconcile the world. But the world is so big. That's why He has given you a sphere, a group of people, relationships that you can influence. They're looking at you, church. They're looking at you. Everybody seated here. They're looking at you. And they're waiting for you. Amen. Now I want to end with this. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38, it says this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. You know, the word moved to compassion means to be moved to one's bowels. Did you hear that? Have you ever had bowel movement? <laughs> have you ever had to go? You know, when you really have to go, you, you, you know, you can't stop it. You know, somebody, you, you know somebody when they up. Yung hindi yung pakale, you're seated in the have to go. There's one time I was preaching and I really had to go. So I just left. I said, I'll be back. And I left because I had to go. You know, when you really have to go, nothing's going to stop you because if not, you're going to make a mess of yourself. Let me encourage you. That's actually not what it means here. But it's funny, no? The kind of urgency, if, we, if it means that, that we have to go. But to be moved to one's bowels means to be moved at the person's very inner core. The very inner core of a person. It's not an emotional move. It's not an, Compassion is not an emotional thing. If you think compassion is pity, it's not. It's so much greater than pity. It's something that strikes you at your inner core. Even if you don't feel like it, you do it. Why? Because it's something, it's a conviction. See, when Jesus looked at the world, there was a conviction. It wasn't pity. It wasn't kawawa naman. It was a deep conviction that He needed to bring salvation. And He said this, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Who are the laborers? Those are the ambassadors. Those who have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Those who, have, who are new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. These ministers have, of reconciliation, these laborers, you and I, have received or have already been reconciled with God. That's why we need to go and share with others what we have. See, good news spreads like wildfire. And this is time, I believe now is the time. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. It is a harvest feast, the first harvest. Let me tell you, there's a greater harvest coming. And then you and I need to be a part of that. Amen? You and I need to be a part of that great harvest. So what are you waiting for? Well, I'm not good enough. Well, Christ gave you this divine exchange. He qualified you. He anointed you. Amen? All we need to do is to choose to go. When am I going to go? Today. But why can it be tomorrow? Today. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. Today is the day of salvation. Let's not wait, guys. We don't want regret to come into our lives. Amen? Amen. I hope you received something today. But once again, like I shared, I, I don't want to just preach a message, but then not do it. So maybe you're out there today and you're, you've never received. You think God is mad at you. You think God is upset, upset with you. You think you're not good enough with God, for God. You think that your life has been a train wreck and God has, can never use you. Let me tell you, God doesn't look at you according to your flesh. 
He doesn't look at you based on what you've done. He's, you're not, he's not looking at you based on your past. He's looking at you through the eyes of grace. He is looking at you through the eyes of love. He is looking at you through the eyes of Jesus. And He wants to bring you or reconcile you to Himself. Why? He wants to give you this divine exchange. So if you're out there today, let me pray with me right now. If you're beside somebody who knows that they need to pray, come on, ambassador. Go grab their hand. Tell them, come on, we're going to pray together. Come on, laborer. We're going to grab their hands. Pray together right now. Let's pray this prayer. We were not praying it to ourselves. We're praying it to the Lord. Join me right now. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me so much that you gave Jesus the first minister of reconciliation. Jesus, you died for me. And in your death, you forgave all my sins. You took my sinful nature. You took my past, my mistakes, my shortcoming, my sin. And in exchange, you gave me your righteousness. You gave me favor before God. Right standing before God. I believe you are the Son of God. And only you can do what you did. And I receive your grace and your forgiveness of sin. And I make you Lord of my life today, right now. Holy Spirit, because of this, you have come into my life. I am your temple. I am a new creation. I have favor with God. And I thank you for this. And I know you will never leave me. And you will never forsake me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. If you said that prayer, you now too become a minister of reconciliation. Let's go and tell everyone about what Jesus has done. He did it first in you, in us. Now we can share with others. Think, who are these people that need to hear this good news? Amen? Well, I hope you had a great time with the service today. I hope that you were encouraged. Maybe even challenged a bit. That's great. So as we go today, I just want to remind you that there is a Zoom room after. Uh, it's, we have a welcome lunch through a Zoom application. And if you want to join us, maybe you have prayer requests. Maybe it's your first time and you prayed that prayer. Or maybe you're just a regular who wants to just hang out with us. Go to that Zoom room. It's, it's right here below. Join us in that room right after this broadcast. We'd love to hang out and meet you. Also, if you're looking for ways to give, we have different online ways that you can transfer. But we also have good news for you today. Starting today, yes, today, this Sunday, the Metro Space will be open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And there will be people here willing, if you would like to give, because we've heard a lot of you want to give your tithes, Physically, you want to do it yourself. We will be here for you as you bring your tithes. If anybody needs urgent prayers, we will be here. But please take note that you have to wear your mask at all times. And we don't be offended that we have to keep social distancing uh, as a priority. Also, your temperature will be taken. And we just need to know we cannot go all together. We need to go one at a time. All right? So that's good news for all of us. Uh, the Metro Space, again, also will be open throughout the week. We'll maybe give you updates on the schedules. If when or when you would, if you're not able to come on Sunday or today, maybe you can come another time. Amen? Church, thank you for tuning in. God bless you. We love you. And we look forward to the day that we can be with each other again. Take care, guys. Have a great Sunday.